Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Throughout our history, humans have kept animals for a variety of purposes and benefits. We keep them for their many products, including their hair, wool, meat, and leather. We keep them to perform tasks such as transportation, pulling plows, or turning machinery. Some we keep for hunting game, others we keep for companionship or protection. More recently in our history, some are kept for experimentation and testing. Animals are a part of our everyday lives and environment. Even individuals who do not keep animals experience the benefits and harms of animals being kept. So our relationship to animals and how we treat them should be of concern to each individual human. Animals are at the heart of many of today's heated ethical and legal debates, some of which enter into the public sphere. Many of those debates concern animal rights and welfare and our responsibilities towards them. While there is a great deal of disagreement over these issues, there is no disagreement that the issues are important. Muslims should be even more concerned about these issues since animals and their treatment are mentioned in Islam's primary textual sources, the Qur'an and prophetic narratives, or hadith. Furthermore, subsequent generations of scholars commented on these source texts and included them in legal and moral literature. In hopes of increasing our involvement in these issues, I would like to present a synopsis of what, inshallah, will be the first of several Taba research pieces related to animals. The focus of this first paper is to clarify the Islamic legal and ethical norms related to kept animals. Further papers will, inshallah, apply this foundation to specific issues. The primary sources for Islamic creed, ethics, and law are the Qur'an and prophetic narrations, also known as the Hadith. Living creatures are a significant part of the Qur'anic text. The Qur'an mentions many classes and species of animals, and six chapters or surahs of the Qur'an are named after animals. We have Surah Al-Baqarah, the surah of the cow, and then we also have Surah Al-An'am, the surah of livestock and the ant, and the spider, and the elephant. Many verses of the Qur'an clarify the relationship between mankind and other animals. Allah informs us in the Qur'an that He created everything that is in the earth for mankind to use, and that He has given mankind dominion over them. For the Qur'an states, He created for you all that there is in the earth. And animals are included among all that is on the earth. Allah also informs us that this creation has been subjected for human use. For the Qur'an states, Have you not seen that Allah has subjected to you all that is in the earth, and the ships that run upon the sea by his command, and he holds back the sky from falling on the earth, and lest by his leave, surely Allah is kind and compassionate to mankind. Additional verses clarify some of the uses that animals provide for mankind. These uses include being sources of nourishment and transportation, being sources of clothing and shelter, being used for warfare, and also for hunting. Other verses urge humans to ponder the creation of animals and the many benefits they provide so that we strengthen our belief in Allah and in order to prompt our thanks for His blessings. And other verses show that the improper treatment of animals and tempering with Allah's creation are both manifestations of misguidance. Clearly, these last verses show that there are limits to how we interact with Allah's creation. The Qur'an does not provide specific guidelines for interacting with animals. However, specific guidelines and details for interacting with them are given in prophetic narrations. Some of these prophetic narrations indicate what sorts of interactions with animals are unlawful. For example, it is prohibited to confine or starve an animal. It is prohibited to mutilate an animal or use it for a target. It is prohibited to brand or hit an animal on the face. It is prohibited to take young animals from their parents, or to burn animals, or to damage their habitats, or to render an animal community or species extinct, or to cut flesh from an animal while it is alive, to deprive a mother's children from her milk via excessive milking, and it is also prohibited to burden an animal with more than it can bear. Other prophetic narrations indicate several obligations and duties towards animals. For example, it is commanded to provide kept animals with adequate food or to let them provide for themselves. 
and it is commanded to avoid harming animals whenever this is possible, and it is commanded to trim one's fingernails when milking, and it is also commanded to leave enough milk for a mother's offspring. Other narrations indicate that it is permissible to kill vermin and aggressive animals, and that it is permissible to keep animals as pets, and that good treatment is a cause for forgiveness, and that bad treatment is a cause for punishment, and also that animals experience feelings and mental states. For the sake of brevity, I will mention here several hadith that cover the bulk of the points I just mentioned. But in the paper, you will find a hadith you will find evidence for every point that I just made above. So the first hadith is that Abu Huraira, and may Allah be pleased with him, reported that the Messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and give him peace, said, A person suffering from intense thirst while on a journey came upon a well. He climbed down into it and drank. When he exited the well, he saw a dog lolling its tongue on account of thirst and eating moistened earth. The person said, this dog has suffered from thirst just as I had suffered from thirst. He climbed down into the well, filled his shoe with water, and he placed it in his mouth until he had climbed up and he gave it to the dog to drink. Allah thanked him for this act and pardoned him. And the companions, may Allah be pleased with them, said, O Messenger of Allah, is there reward for us even in serving these animals? And he replied, Yes, there is a reward for rendering service to every living thing. Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, reported that the Messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and give him peace, said, A woman was tormented because of a cat which she had confined until it died, and for this she entered hellfire. She did not provide it with food or drink as it was confined, nor did she free it so that it might eat of the vermin of the earth. So, vermin of the earth here, insects, rodents. So in this hadith, she kept the animal confined, and that's a sin, and she also prevented it from going out and finding its own sustenance. Shaddad ibn Aus, may Allah be pleased with him, said that the Prophet, may Allah bless him and give him peace, said, indeed Allah has prescribed beneficence, or ihsan, in all things. When you kill, kill well, and when you slaughter, slaughter well. Let each one of you sharpen his blade, and let him spare suffering to the animal he slaughters. Ibn Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, came across some young men from the Quraysh tribe who had tied a bird at which they had then shot arrows. Eve, every arrow that missed would belong to the bird's owner. The men scattered as soon as they saw Ibn Umar, and thereupon Ibn Umar said, Who has done this? Allah has cursed him who has done this. Indeed, the Messenger of Allah, may Allah bless him and give him peace, said that there uh, said, may curses be upon whomever makes a living thing a target for marksmanship. Abdullah ibn Ja'far, may Allah be pleased with him, relates that one day he rode with the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they entered the garden of a man from the Medinan helpers from the original inhabitants of Medina. And when a camel saw the Prophet, may Allah bless him and give him peace, it suddenly wept tenderly, making a yearning sound, and its eyes flowed with tears. So upon seeing the Prophet, who is a mercy to all of mankind, the camel wept and approached him. The Prophet came to it and wiped the temple of its head, and then the camel became silent. He then said, Who is the master of this camel? Whose camel is this? And a young man came, and he said, This is mine, Messenger of Allah. And the Prophet said, Do you not fear Allah about this beast which Allah has put in your possession? It has complained to me that you keep it hungry, and you load it heavily. Which fatigues it? So the Qur'an states that mankind has been given dominion over animal kind, along with permission to make use of those animals. It also warns that abuse is a sign of misguidance. Prophetic narrations clarify that our interactions with animals are constrained by responsibilities to provide for them, to show them kindness, to avoid harm, and to relieve their suffering. One major takeaway here is that animal welfare and care have been an integral part of Islam from its very beginning. 
These verses and hadith mentioned above are part of the source material that Muslim scholars consider when developing rulings related to the treatment of animals. Animals are mentioned in a variety of places within legal literature, including rulings related to their purity, their edibility, how they are slaughtered, hunting with animals, financial transactions involving animals and contests, and many other places. But the bulk of rulings related to the treatment of kept animals is found within the chapter of marriage, within sections dealing with financial support of dependents. People who have read fiqh, this is in the section of nafaqa, uh, support for dependents. These rulings have been standard fare since the earliest written books of law. In my paper, I focused on a single school of law, the school of Imam Shafi, who passed away in 820 of the Common Era. This is the third century of the Hijri era. I stated with my works, I started with the works of the Imam and moved my way from older texts to newer texts. And I found that Imam Shafi included these rulings in his book Al Um. And out of the more than 40 Shafi texts that I read, I did not find a single one except that it included care for animals when discussing caring for family. That these rulings are consistently included here alongside one's obligation towards his parents, wife, and children shows the elevated status of kept animals. That we're including them in sections, uh, in, in the section of caring for one's family shows that by taking possession of an animal, it is as though you're taking it and making it a part of your household. And just if you, as you have responsibility to members of your household who are humans, you also have pretty high responsibility to members of your household who aren't human. Imam al-Ghazali, who passed away in 1111 Common Era, so he was approximately 900 years, excuse me, 300 years after Imam Shafi, provides a typical coverage of this section in his book known as Al Wasit. He writes, It is obligatory for an owner to provide fodder for his animals since their lives are inviolable, and due to this inviolability, it is not permissible to abuse them nor to slaughter them except to eat them. Similarly, he does not exhaust their milk, thereby harming their progeny. It is permissible to steal fodder and thread to suture a wound if it is on the verge of dying, according to the most evident opinion of the school. A traveler puts the need of animals a traveler puts the need of animals for water above his own need of water for ablution for prayer, and he thus makes dry ablution with dirt. This is uh, um, known in Arabic as tayammum, um, when there is an absence of water or an inability to use water, we are allowed to use dirt as a means of rendering acts of worship permissible. So even though water is the base and that's what we're obligated to do, here we have a case where an animal's need of that water is considered of a higher priority than us using that water for an act of worship. If the land becomes barren, he must provide fodder for animals that graze. It is not obligatory for him to maintain his house, irrigation canals, and immovable property, even if those are on the verge of destruction, since inviolability is for that which possesses life. If he refuses to provide fodder to an animal, the judge can force him to sell it or sell it on his behalf. Something to note here is that animals have sanctity by virtue of being alive and possessing a soul, not just when they are someone's property. Legal literature focuses on the status of actions with respect to permissibility and validity. There are other writings that focus on actions, but from a broader perspective, that includes welfare, maslaha, and beneficence, ihsan. So alongside legal rulings, like those presented in the quotation from the wasit of Imam al-Ghazali, there are also discussions related to the welfare of kept animals, as well as 
ways of being ben beneficent towards them. The writings of Al Iz ibn Abd al Salam, another Shafi scholar who passed away in 1261 of the Common Era, provided one of the best examples of literature incorporating welfare and beneficent uh, into legal issues. His book, Qawa'id al Ahkam fi Masalih al Anam, uh, which is translated as Rules of the Derivation of Laws for Reforming the People or the Masses, focuses on welfare. In it, he includes a section devoted to man's duties towards animals. The section mentions duties related to slaughtering and hunting and duties related to kept animals. The duties of keepers towards kept animals include that the keepers continue to provide for their animals' needs even when an animal is ill or no longer provides a benefit. This duty to provide for animals that are not useful is particularly interesting. It shows that the sanctity of animal life is not dependent on an animal being property or presenting a potential benefit to its owner. It also suggests that keepers of animals do not have an absolute right to dispose and manage of their kept animals however they see fit. If an owner has a duty to provide for an animal even after it is sick or infirm, then what about releasing an animal into an environment where it cannot fend for itself? For example, the emirates in summer when people like to take trips and they will put animals outside and let the animal know it's up to you to go find your own food which is kind of ridiculous here it would be like taking a goldfish and putting it out on your veranda and telling it to go find water and food it's not going to happen here the goldfish is a great is a good example because no one can like imagine that but when it comes to cats and dogs, people report that it's a similar thing. They can't find enough to sustain themselves. The section mentions other duties, including not burdening an animal beyond its capacity and separating aggressive or harmful animals from their victims. It is also a duty to provide animals with shelter and pasture that is appropriate and well kept and to allow animals to mate during their mating season. al Iz ibn Abd al-Salam also wrote about beneficence towards kept animals in several parts of his Shajarat al Ma'arifa fil Ahwal, translated as Trees of All Sorts of Knowledge and States. And in this book, what he tried to do is demonstrate how practicing Islamic law is a vehicle for beneficence and excellence. And in section 390 of the book, uh, which is titled Beneficence or Ihsan towards uh, owned animals, he includes additional details and some of the reasoning behind the rulings. He writes, Beneficence towards kept animals is by providing its fodder or grazing it as much as it needs. It is by being gentle when loading it and walking it, so one does not make them responsible for something they are not able to do. It is by not milking its milk except what is in excess of its children's needs to treat its mange and to treat its sicknesses. If he slaughters, he does it with beneficence, by sharpening the blade, cutting quickly, and with the animal laid down gently, and includes leaving it, leaving it alone after slaughtering until it becomes cool, so until all of the signs of life are gone. So you don't slaughter and then immediately start butchering it. You slaughter and then you wait for the animal's life to completely be expelled so that we don't hurt it any more than is absolutely necessary in order to slaughter it. Beneficence includes that if some animals harm another animal, such as by goring it, even if some annoy others through headbutting or the like, he separates them. Since the Prophet, may Allah bless him and give him peace, said that there is a reward for service to every living animal and Allah Most High says in the Qur'an, whoever does an Adam's weight of good will see it. Also the Prophet said, on resurrection day, rights will be paid to those whom they are due, so much so that a, hum that a hornless sheep can seek retaliation by punishing the horned sheep that broke its horns. Whoever sees someone load an animal with more than it can bear is to order him to reduce it. 
If the owner refuses, he removes it with his hand. Since the prophet, may Allah bless him and give him peace, said, He who amongst you sees something abominable should modify it with the help of his hand. And if he has not strength enough to do it, then he should do it with his tongue. And if he has not strength enough to do that, even then he should detest it from his heart, as that is the least of faith. He, may Allah bless him and give him peace, also said, When you travel through a land where there is plenty of vegetation, you should go slow and give the camels a chance to enjoy the benefit of the earth. When they travel through a land where there is a scarcity of vegetation, you should hasten with them. And in another narration he said, a prostitute was forgiven as a result of giving water to a dog. A significant addition here is applying the principle of enjoining the right and forbidding the wrong, al-amr bil-ma'ruf wa nahiyan al-munkar, when someone has overburdened their animal. If it applies in this particular type of animal abuse, it follows that it also applies to other types as well. Advocating on behalf of voiceless animals to ensure that they receive their rights is one form of carrying out this religious duty. As mentioned above, Allah has granted humankind dominion over animals, though it has been tempered in many ways. The legal and ethical contents of this tempered dominion, when followed, lead to welfare and beneficence for both man and animal kind. And bringing this about is part of mankind's appointment to being stewards over the earth. It is a religious obligation that keepers of animals provide sufficient upkeep for their animals. This upkeep is a requirement of keeping any creature possessing a soul. This requirement can be enforced by the authorities. In some situations, the Muslim community may even be required to assist in providing for these animals. It is also a religious obligation to treat animals with all manners of mercy and kindness and to avoid unnecessarily harming or annoying them in any way. These attitudes and concerns are essential elements of Islam's worldview and social philosophy, and they were reflected in Muslim history as can be seen in the many endowments or awqaf that were established for the sake of providing for animals. For example, in Damascus there is a river known as the Barada River that runs through it. It used to be a very beautiful river with beautiful pasture on either side and it was among the best property uh, in the city. And at an early point in Damascus's history, someone purchased the land and he made it a, an endowment for animals that needed to be retired. So a horse that was too old to draw a plow or to pull a cart or a cow that was sick and we weren't going to be able to eat it, or some other animal that had gotten too old to provide service. Instead of putting it down prematurely, they would let it wander along the bank uh, to literally go to pasture, right? And this was a mercy and a kindness to these animals. So this is an example where some of the best property of the city was put aside for the care of animals. And there's tons of other examples of this in Egyptian and Turkish history. Um, and a current example uh, that you can see is there's a documentary that you can now find uh, advertised on YouTube called The Cats of Istanbul. And it shows how just your average people in Istanbul take care of the cats. They take care of the other citizens of the city that live around them. And both of those examples I gave are examples of the Islamic worldview in action. This is how things were and how things are supposed to be. It is important to reiterate that these rulings are not something optional, that Muslims are free to take or leave as they see fit or whenever they feel sentimental. Rather, these rulings are a part of the sacred law which holds true across all times and places. It is this sacred law that is the standard that Muslims return to when evaluating issues and actions. It is hoped that this paper will enable a reassessment of our treatment of kept animals, both those we keep ourselves and those that are kept for our benefit, 
It is not just the hot contemporary issues such as intensive animal farming, animal experimentation, pet abandonment and caring for strays, and destruction of animal, animal habitats that need to be assessed in light of the sacred law, but also our role as stewards of the earth. As crucial as it is that we remind ourselves of how we are supposed to treat the animals we keep and to reassess how we keep them, it is even more crucial that we always keep in mind that while the sacred law places such a high value on the sanctity of animal life, it places an even higher value on the sanctity of human life. Indeed, how we treat humans and other animals today is part of what determines our collective futures in this world and the next. Alhamdulillah. Wa alaikum wa salam. The Thank you. The book sets down the normative rulings that we would find in classical Shafi fiqh. And it doesn't always directly address a lot of the circumstances we see today. So if we were to go solely by what is in that book and not practice the exercising of applying fiqh to the contemporary context, we would probably say that you can't euthanize an animal under any circumstances. Okay, That's what some people might come to. But if we take a, a larger look at the rest of the sharia, at the rest of the law, we can find many principles that would tip the scales towards the permissibility. So for example, if an animal has a communicable disease that is going to be fatal, there is a reason for trying to limit the spread of the contagion to other animals. Um, if an animal is suffering and it's a non-edible animal and there's absolutely no hope of it recovering, um, what we could do quickly is we could borrow a ruling from the Maliki school of law which says that non-edible animal, non animals that are on the, the verge of death can be euthanized. Okay. And we can eat their meat, right? So why would we euthanize them as mercy towards them? Okay, so there's another thing that tips the scale. Um, if we look at why it is we're not allowed to kill animals, it tends to be um, because, excuse me, let me back up. If we look at all the reasons that we're not allowed to kill them, um, it tends to have to do with not wasting a, a life without there being some benefit behind it. So in the case of an animal that's edible, we would slaughter it and, if possible, make use of its meat. In the case of a non-edible animal, we could look for other benefits. So, for example, the, the benefit of public health. Right? Other benefits might be um, reducing the suffering of that animal. Okay? Typically, we say that we have a lot of evidence that humans cannot take their own life. No matter how bad their situation is, they cannot take their own life. One of the reasons behind this is that hu humans enduring um, suffering and enduring hard, difficult situations are causes for forgiveness and for obtaining um, rewards in the afterlife. That same purpose doesn't exist with, with animals, because animals are not responsible. Whatever they do in this world, it, it's not going to determine their fate in the afterlife, as far as we know. And so we find that a lot of the textual evidence against taking the life of an animal 
on the verge of death, any euthanizing, we find that a lot of the evidence really, any, it might not be so strong when it comes to animals. So we can take the ruling from the Maliki school, which is that we can euthanize a non-edible animal that's on the verge of death. Okay. And we can also, if we would like to stick to our own Shafi method, we can find many reasons why it probably is going to be okay. okay. It's a difficult situation. Anyone that's had an animal that they love knows how difficult it can be to watch the animal be in intense pain and then feel that there's a, a bit of a, a dilemma. Do we put it down for the sake of mercy or do we make it endure something that it can never recover from? So for the time being, go with the Malachis. Question? I think I'm more in need of your advice on this one, since you deal with the, the practical matters. Um, over the weekend, I was looking through a lot of uh, newspaper articles in the National. And it's interesting, the UAE apparently has some very good animal protection laws, but there's a problem with getting them enforced. Um, it's very sad if you read some of the newspaper articles you'll find that like two years ago I think a cat in Raha Garden was shot with an arrow the cat was just wandering over the fence and someone shot it for no reason and then there was also a case I think of a dog two puppies where someone had like cut off one of their legs so there's lots of abuse that goes on and even though the law is there it's very difficult to enforce so I don't know how we can get them to enforce it. Um, this is something that uh, I, I would love to assist people in, in trying to do this, but my hands are, are tied. I have no way to do this. Perhaps what we could try to do is at least try to educate people and change their values and change the way that they look at the animals. Um, because unfortunately, enforcement is retroactive, right? It's after the problem has already happened. It would be much more useful if we could try to keep it from ever happening to begin with. Um, so what do we do? Call the cops. Other than that, I don't know. It's a good idea. Just call the cops. Yeah. And, uh, um, how has anything been effective? Have you found anything to be effective? Ruslan, do you have any advice? I think uh, what you said, educa uh, education is, is a very important thing. Um, but also education that comes, especially in a country like the UAE, that comes from the top. Uh, not we are a volunteer organization, for example, and uh, we are mostly run by Western people. So for us, of course, to talk to local people and to to Arab community comes across as sometimes lecturing or patronizing, so it might be misunderstood. Um, so if it comes from the government in a much stronger way, in a much more 
committed way, I think that would be extremely helpful. That's one I possibility. Agree. Um, hopefully, we'll be presenting the same paper. This paper is in both English and Arabic. And I know that we've sent copies to our colleagues in Al Qaf, uh, the religious endowments mm. uh, department. So I know that this is something that they will be reading and taking interest in. And hopefully in the future, this can be something that they, they do speak about in public. Um, uh, from what I recall, Falcon Hospital, on their website, they have a, uh, they have a, a document that tries to um, show I guess religious supporting behind the proper treatment of animals also. Um, I, I had hoped that some of the vets would come also because it might be useful to supply them with some of this material in Arabic to give to people that they see uh, uh, abusing the animals. Um, Roslan, I hate to put you on the spot, <laughs> but how should this be handled? For for the other attendees, uh, the reason for referring to me is because I am currently employed by Abu Dhabi Police, and um, what I'm involved in right now is uh, uh, something that has to do with uh, s recommending the possibility and the feasibility of uh, providing a wider um, authority to the police uh, to investigate and to prosecute um, cases involving environmental issues which includes animals. So inshallah the paper is being prepared. I'm, I'm one of the team that's preparing the paper uh, and the proposal inshallah and uh, although it's not, uh, it's not f firmed yet but it is uh, being discussed and it is being looked at. Uh, understanding that I'm also a, an animal lover, same as uh, Sheikh Musa. Uh, so uh, we understand the importance, the gravity and the urgency to address this issue before it gets out of hand. What we've done so far is that we've engaged certain schools uh, when we, because we went there to deliver talks. So one of the talks include uh, caring for the environment. Uh, so we tell them about not littering and at the same time we tell them about not uh, abusing animals uh, even their own pets so hopefully it trickles down to even if it is small margin of the population but it is still a margin is still there inshallah hopefully uh, we will see the wider authority to investigate and prosecute environmental cases involving uh, animals even trees or open spaces uh, come to fruition, inshallah. The animal's natural habitat is their environment. What's your own opinion of people taking them out, out of their environment and buying of selling of them and forming them as a pet? Are you referring specifically to like exotic animals and wildlife? Yeah, uh, it can also that, like to wild animals. Uh, okay. I know some people personally who took tigers. Okay. When it comes to things like cats and dogs and horses and cows, these animals have all been domesticated. Um, they've been around people for thousands of years. And because of that, when they're around people and around civilization uh, that's become almost their natural habitat it's it's at least a habitat that is not completely foreign to them in the case of exotic animals like taking monkeys and taking leopards and tigers out of their their natural environment I personally don't see uh, a reason to do it unless it's for the sake of preserving that animal Okay, there are some endangered species that do need protection from human beings and they need protection from just dealing with environmental issues that are going to render them extinct. 
those I think need to be put in places that will keep them safe. But I really, I cannot see very much justification for taking exotic animals out of their natural wild habitat and bringing them into cities in very confined spaces. What I, I personally cannot see a justification for it. And what about cats and dogs? Cats and dogs have been partners with human beings for a long time. In their past history, up until recently, our relationship with cats and dogs has always been a working relationship. Okay, mm -hmm. we use dogs for protection, for hunting, companionship. We use cats for pest control, right? And there is this, uh, this symbiotic relationship between us and them. It's only been recent within the last 200 years that we've started breeding animals purely for aesthetic purposes. Okay, so trying to come up with breeds that look a particular way and don't have any real practical function. This is a very recent thing. And when people sell and buy animals, don't what is that supposed to be? Um, this is something kind of complicated because when it comes to animals that are edible, mm -hmm. we can engage in trade. But when it comes to animals that are not edible and are not pure and or do not have any real benefit. In those cases, sale becomes very difficult. It's no longer a valid sale. Mm -hmm. So buying and selling, it becomes something that Islamic law has a difficulty with. There, these are sales that there's something wrong with them. Um, right now, I think there's several international agreements on the buying and selling of exotic animals. And from what I understand, the UAE is one of the countries that has signed this. I think it's called CITE. Um, okay, so if we're in a country that signed this agreement, then we're bound to follow it. If the, the local ruler has decided that it's in the interest of the country to abide by that, then we as residents of that country need to follow that. Thank you. Nihad? It's a short one. Uh, from a fiqh point of view, this means that uh, donating, a uh, giving sadaqa that is in uh, financial terms like money or cash uh, for animal welfare or for animals in general, that would be still have the same uh, thawab just as giving sadaqa for human beings? Um. Okay, we can give sadaqa, we can give voluntary charity to animals, yes. We can't give zakat to animals. Oh, okay, course. we can give sadaqa, so we can give sadaqa. voluntary charity. Uh, do we expect that you are going to be getting a reward for it? Yes, because of hadith, for example, the one about in the service of every living creature, there is a, a reward. Okay, so we have hadith that indicate that. I can't tell you what would be more beneficial. Okay, giving sadaqa to a human being who's on the verge of dying of starvation versus giving sadaqa to an animal that is just going to go get groomed, obviously the sadaqa here isn't being put in the proper place. But if you're giving sadaqa to a human being so they can go watch a movie or buy something they don't need versus giving sadaqa for buying food for um, animals that are starving. Obviously, this is the better place. So I can't give you one answer that will apply to every single case. We have to look at the case, and we have to then balance out the priorities. Okay, so if it's going towards the preservation of life, whether it's human life or animal life, human it, life if we have to choose between human life and animal life, human life comes first. And if we have to choose between Hu uh, animal life and a human luxury or need. Animal life is going to take priority. So this means that it would be difficult that we see, for example, in uh, the Red Crescent uh, categories of donations, it would be difficult to see something like animal welfare or something. Because when you compare it to other uh, 
uh, coupons for refugees, for example, or disaster uh, areas? Um, this is tricky because here we also have to look at our our responsibilities that um, local responsibilities seem to be of a greater degree than very very far away responsibilities so we could probably come up with a scenario where feeding a cat that's on the verge of, of death would have a higher priority than feeding someone who's on the other side of the world we we might be able to find a situation like that the reason being that we are more responsible for the things around us than we are for the things that are much much further away from us so as far as like the red crescent goes um, in general I think humans probably ought to be getting the priority here but we might find some cases where we would feel that we really should give a priority to local concerns thank you, thank you. the philosophers and 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 uh, lawyers and fuqaha can arrange scenarios so just about anything comes okay and then we can do the opposite so I, i'm sure we can construct a scenario where we get one answer and then we get the opposite Following uh, the earlier discussion on domestication of animals, with regards to like house cats or dogs, uh, people in modern day will like declaw cats, or sometimes they'll do stuff like neutering the animal so they can't reproduce. Is there any specific rulings that you've come across that relate to these issues? Okay, this is just off the top of my head. Th these are some of the issues that. I plan to be looking into to try to find better answers. Okay, in the case of declining cats, I, r I cannot find any justification for it. If we look at what vets report about it, it's an incredibly painful thing for the cats because you're actually cutting off one of the knuckles of, of the cat. And it's great for the upholstery, but it's horrible for the cat. Yeah, it is, and and there we go. Thank you. And we already have the the hadith that curses the mutilation of animals. So there, right now, there is a a strong text that would ban doing the um, cutting off of the nails. And that really, it's not in the best interest of the animal to do that. If you can't arrange your furniture in a way that it's okay with the cats, maybe you shouldn't be keeping the cat. Maybe you should put the cat somewhere where it's not a problem, right? In the case of neutering, um, typically we're not supposed to neuter animals unless it's in their interest. And the older books, what they had mentioned is examples of interests are, for example, um, the wholesomeness of the meat, where neutering an animal makes it produce better meat. Okay, there is something that's in the benefit of what that animal is there for which is for meat okay so it's in some way it's in the benefit of the animal it's also in the towards the purpose of what the animal is for which is eating right can we make a similar argument for dogs and cats no we don't eat dogs and cats what we might be able to do is look at the welfare the long-term welfare of those animals um, stray cats and stray dogs if they aren't neutered they will reproduce and there will be a scarcity of food and some of them are going to die of starvation and a lot of them will be fighting over the food right none of that's in the interest of either those animals or us and when it comes also to say let's say cats if a cat is not neutered, it's probably going to go in and get fights. And here, if a cat gets into a fight long enough, eventually it's going to pick up feline AIDS. And then it's going to die a somewhat slow and not very nice death. What would be in the best interest of the cat? 
and what would be in the in best interest of the stray dog. That we neuter them to try to control their population so that they don't become a public menace and then have to be euthanized. And that we neuter the, the cats so that the same doesn't happen and also so that they don't get communicable diseases that then become a bigger menace for the entire population. So it would be better to leave them alone so all of those things happen or to look at the possibility of neutering. If we look at it from like the perspective of public health and the best interest of the cats, it might be better to take the route of neutering. Might be. We are dealing with this uh, on a daily basis because we, we work for a cat organization, Feline Friends, and of course we get many times confronted, why do I have to sterilize my cat and uh, uh, why do street cats have to be sterilized? One reason is, as you rightly said already, they get in terrible fights with horrible wounds and these wounds get infected, especially when they are outside, the, the, the flies go in there, the maggots go in there, and these cats die really, really horrible. They get the FIV, uh, so it's highly contagious, so they spread then a disease which inf impacts all the other cats. Plus, if you sterilize a cat, it lives up to seven years longer because it can't get urinary uh, infection or cancer of uh, the reproductive system. So it's much, much healthier for the cat. Plus, with us being taking away their environment uh, with, with more, more, more roads and more houses and more building everywhere, we force them to, and, and not, not reducing the population, we force them into migrating and moving out and fighting more. So in a way, we are causing their misery. So I think we have, in a way, the responsibility to help them reduce their misery or make it bearable for them. So that's why we support sterilization in a very strong way. Satisfied for now, or yeah, no. I, I wasn't an advocate of sterilizing or, or neutering our cats, and we learned the hard way here about what happens because our prized cat ended up getting into fights and into romantic encounters. And one morning we found him outside, where he did one encounter too many, and he was dead. And this is one of those things, if, if we had sterilized him early enough, he, he probably would have been staying home that night. Um, and again, if we look at it from the perspective of what's in the best interest of the cat, what's in their best interest, um, living a short, horrible life full of lots of fights, or living a, a longer life where there might be less um, competition with other cats because they haven't been born, which would be better. I think having a smaller population of cats would probably be, be better. And there's been tons of studies about, uh, what they call it, trap, neuter and release. There's been a ton of studies about TNR and its effect on cat colonies and whether the cat colonies end up uh, coming to like a stable size um, and that the overall health of the colony and what they typically find out is it, it's a very good benefit for those cats. So while they might not have progeny, they at least will have a decent life. Uh, anything you would say, Sir Musa? Um, for people who are involved with animal advocacy, uh, we're here to help, inshallah. Uh, if there's any information that I can provide you, if there's anything that you can help me in trying to research uh, topics that are pressing and need to be answered, just let me know. We're at your service. And inshallah, we'll see you in the future as more papers come up on this topic, inshallah. Thank you all for attending. Um, I know this is early in the week. People have other things to do. and. You've given us some of your prime time, so I thank you for that. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Musa, and thank you, uh, thank you guys for coming, and I hope to see you 
the next events inshallah thank you very much thank you